Hi again, and let's today take a look at something called reactivity. Let's look at these two images first of all. First I've shown a, a copper roof. And copper over the course of time will oxidize and produce copper oxide, the green material you see on the top of the roof. Below though is a gold coin, and that gold coin essentially will remain that same color for millennia. Why is it some metals react and others don't? And that's what today's topic is about, predicting whether or not reactions will happen using a redox table. So let's start with a simple experiment. Here I have a complementary experiment, a piece of copper sitting in a zinc solution and a piece of zinc sitting in a copper solution. We can see from the evidence in the picture that the second beaker, the zinc with the copper solution, appears to be undergoing a reaction and the first one isn't. Let's summarize the ions below. So I'm going to show this as an equilibrium arrow. In the forward direction, we have a reaction. Zinc and the copper solution react, but in the reverse direction, we essentially get no reaction. To understand why, let's visit their oxidation states. So I've identified the oxidation states in the diagram. Let's begin by taking a look at the copper. The copper ion has gained two electrons, so the copper has been reduced. The cause, the reducing agent, is the metal zinc. Similarly, zinc has lost two electrons. That means the zinc has been oxidized and the cause, the copper ion. That's considering the forward direction. Now let's take a look at the reaction happening in reverse. So I can take a look at the zinc ion. It essentially gains, uh, lost two electrons. So that particular material has been reduced and the reducing agent then is the copper metal. Similarly, I can take a look at the copper it's been oxidized because it's lost two electrons and the cause would be the zinc ions. So I have oxidizing agents in both the forward and the reverse direction as well as reducing agents. So why does the reaction happen in the forward direction? Well, it happens to do with the strength of our agents. In the forward direction, I can state that the zinc metal is a stronger reducing agent than the copper metal. Similarly, I can say that the copper ion is a stronger oxidizing agent than the zinc ion. I've placed that information over here on the left, and now we'll take it and use it um, by looking at a few of the tables in the IV data booklet. First of all, there's your activity series, which is table number 25. And I'm gonna focus here on the reducing agents for a moment. I've located on the table zinc and copper and their approximate position. Here we have a series of experiments conducted in a similar manner, which ranks essentially far more numerous metals than just the two. And at the top of the table, I have my strongest reducing agents. Reducing agents, remember, these are substances that want to lose electrons. So lithium, cesium, rubidium, potassium, all want to lose electrons. Hence, they're strong reducing agents. While at the bottom of the table, metals such as mercury, platinum, gold, they don't have a tendency to lose their electrons as easily. Now let's use this table to look at reactivity for a moment. Suppose I have a piece of zinc sitting in a lead solution. From their states, I can say that the zinc, which has no charge, has lost no electrons. Lead, which has a plus two charge, must have lost two electrons. According to my table, zinc wants to lose electrons more than lead does. So this is not a stable situation. Zinc would prefer to lose the electrons more. So this combination will react such that zinc can lose the electrons and lead doesn't. Let's look at a different combination of metals. Zinc with magnesium. Again, zinc has no charge, so that essentially has lost no electrons. Magnesium, a plus two charge, has lost two electrons. And this is in accordance with the table. Magnesium does want to lose electrons more. It's a stronger reducing agent. And since it's already lost the electrons, there's no need for it to react. So I get no reaction in this case. So this is how I can use the activity series to predict whether or not metals will react with solutions. There's a second table that's also available, um, a redox table called your standard electrode potentials. It's far more comprehensive than our activity series because not only does it contain metals, but non-metals as well. So again, on the reduced species side, very similar to my activity series, I have my strongest reducing agents up at the top and my weakest reducing agents down at the bottom. 
Now, if you look more carefully at the table, you can see that it's arranged in the following fashion. An oxidizing agent plus an electron produces a reducing agent. So I'm going to take my oxidizing agent column over here and make it agree with the table. I'm going to flip it over and match it up with its corresponding metals. And you can see these two reactions on the table. And again, their position is the same as that shown in my small table on the left. But what you'll note now is the oxidizing agents occupy the lower left corner of the table. Let's see what elements there. Well, you notice it's fluorine, and this makes perfect sense. Oxidizing agents, they're substances that cause oxidation, so they like to gain electrons. There's no element that wants electrons more than fluorine does. You can also see fluorine down there, chlorine, bromine, all examples of nonmetals, substances that want to gain electrons and hence are very strong oxidizing agents. Now let's look at using this table then to study reactivity. So again, from our first experiment, I know that copper and zinc ions don't react. I'm going to locate them on this table. So there I have the copper solid and the zinc ion. Again, this combination is not going to undergo a reaction. I know that zinc is a stronger reducing agent. Zinc wants to lose electrons more than copper does, and it already has in this reaction, so there's no need for it to proceed. The reverse does react, and again, I'll locate those on the table. Again, this reaction happens because zinc wants to lose electrons more than copper does, and in this situation, copper has lost the electrons zinc would prefer to, so there will be a reaction. I can then take these two half reactions, much like in Hess's law, and add them together to determine the overall reaction. So you can see that I flipped the upper equation and left the lower equation as it was. I make sure the number of electrons lost and gained are the same, and then I proceed to add them together to get the overall reaction. So what you see on that green diagonal, when things lie on a green diagonal sloping upward to the right, those combinations will react. Whereas on the red diagonal, those combinations do not react. So let's take a look at a second example. Tin, Sn, reacting with a magnesium ion solution. They lie on that red diagonal. That particular combination is not likely to react. Nickel with lead, however, I can see that that combination lies on an upward sloping diagonal to the right. That combination will react. So again, I take the two equations and add them together to get my target equation. Again, making sure the number of electrons lost and gained are the same. And I total it to get my final equation. So that's how we can use this table to predict reactions. If the two participants are upward sloping to the right, as shown by the green diagonals, those combinations will react. However, if they're, however, if they're downward sloping to the right, then those combinations won't react. So I hope you found this useful. And remember, if you did, please give me a thumbs up.